Hello everybody and welcome to the Dry Dock episode 190. This week the questions are taken from guide 239 on the W and Z class destroyers of World War II and the Wednesday video on the Guadalcanal campaign that covered the finale, Operation Key and the Battle of Rennell Island. So let's begin. We Say No to Pay to Win asks, I heard the HMS Warspite when doing shore bombardment of Normandy was able to successfully jam the radar of German guns. Was this common in World War II? So radar jamming in World War II was very much game of one-upmanship. Initially, the capability to jam radar wasn't there. So say like the Battle of Britain, chain home, chain home low. The Germans didn't really have much success or really much inkling that they even had to try and jam the British radar for a good while but then they would eventually bring in some countermeasures and fundamentally it depends on what you're trying to jam and the relative strength of your own signal generators. Uh, now obviously there are more physical ways of jamming radar like what the British called window, what we now call chaff, i.e. dumping large amounts of aluminium foil into the sky, which for the radar wavelength of the time did work quite well. But in terms of active jamming, as I said, it, it, it depends, one, on the technology level, do you actually know that you're being detected by radar in the first place? And with the various advances and changes in radar, that wasn't always the case. So when you're looking at, say, for example, U-boats, Initially, they wondered how on earth are the Allied aircraft finding us so easily. And then they figured out, oh, it must be because they've got this ASV radar. Once an ASV radar equipped aircraft crashed in German occupied Europe and the Germans were able to examine it. So then they were able to reverse engineer a radar detection device. So up until that point, they had no way of knowing that there was a radar even pointed at them, let alone what frequency it was on. Then, as things advanced, cavity magnetrons were incorporated, etc., radar frequencies changed, and all of a sudden the old detectors didn't work, and then it was a matter of trying to either figure out or wait for a new example of allied radar to fall into your hands to work out what the new frequencies were, and then try and engineer a detector for that. And to a certain degree, it's the same in the allied camp, you know, as it, I mean, not so much with the Italians or the Japanese, but especially with the Germans, as German radar advances, you're constantly having to work out what the new frequencies are. So there will be periods when it's just not possible to even think about jamming the radar because you don't even know that the radar is actually pointing at you and working. But in the periods of time that you do know this and you can detect the incoming radar, jamming was... I would say relatively common by the middle of World War II and gradually became more and more common as time went on. And as I said, you can see this on both sides. I mean, it's not strictly radar jamming, it's more radio signal jamming, but radar is a form of radio signal, so it kind of fits the bill as an example. But when the Germans were firing the Henschel anti-shipping missiles and the Fritz X guided bombs, um, when you got to the radio controlled versions um, of the latter and so forth then initially they were very effective one of the major countermeasures to them other than shooting down the aircraft that were carrying them was to develop jammers um, you know jammers that didn't rely on lots of handheld razors um, in order to make them veer off and, and crash or just no longer be able to be under the control of the operators and when it came to radar, you had as the same kind of thing. So, you know, with Normandy, it was known that the Germans had radar on some of their coastal batteries. And so efforts were made to figure out what you needed to transmit in order to jam that radar and so on and so forth. The, the biggest issue, as I say, is the, the relative power generation capacity, because at its very most basic radar jamming can just be transmitting blankets of noise on the same frequency as the radar that's emitting. So they just receive a bunch of nonsense signals and can't make heads or tails of it. The problem with that is that if you're talking about, let's say, for example, the radar on a fighter, maybe a night fighter, um, 
or a bomber, you have a limited amount of power output. Whereas a radar that's mounted on a ship or a radar that's mounted in a ground station will, in theory, have access to a lot more power. So a ground-based or ship-based jammer could quite easily knock back the radars of aircraft, but aircraft-based jammers wouldn't necessarily have a huge amount of success knocking back ship-based or ground-based radars, again, assuming that it's the kind of radar that can act, use a significant amount of power which would be available to it on a ship. Some radar that was ship-mounted actually had relatively low power outputs and therefore was more vulnerable to aircraft-based jamming. But generally speaking, jamming is very much contextual. So, for example, when you have a big threat like shore-based gun batteries, then the Allied ships in the fleet will be equipped with jammers that will work against that particular frequency of radar. But, for example, uh, the German fire control radar that was equipped on Tirpitz, that's a completely different kind of set. Um, it's related to the gunnery control radars on the German coastal guns, but because of the slight differences in frequency and, and all sorts of things like that, if a battleship that came off the D-Day landing still with its anti-coastal gun radar jammer happened to run into Tirpitz three, four months later, there's no guarantee that that jammer will work against the surface search or the fire control radar of Tirpitz. And if it works against one, it probably won't work against the other. And you know, the, the threat of Tirpitz and its very specific radar setup, which changed several times during its career, um, was not considered enough to try and develop jammers to be equipped to every ship that might actually run into it against those specific frequencies, because apart from anything, as I said, the radar setup actually changed on Tirpitz several times. So even if you somehow knew exactly which radars were on Tirpitz and what their frequencies were six months down the line, that may no longer be applicable. The kind of multi-frequency or frequency hopping jamming devices that are around nowadays weren't really a thing in World War II. Hammond Pickle asks, what's the advantage of four single gun turrets over two two-gun turrets on destroyers. Surely the latter would be less mass, especially mass higher up due to super firing, and maybe cheaper? Is it combat durability, i.e. you'd lose a small fraction of firepower to any given turret if it's knocked out? The two main advantages of having multiple single guns over twin turret mounts or twin gun mounts on destroyers comes from partially, as you say, durability. So if you have a pair of twin mounts like many Italian destroyers did and that mount gets a hit given that you know destroyer gun mounts generally aren't the best protected things in the world so if they take a hit in a destroyer versus destroyer engagement they're probably going to be disabled those gun shields really are there to just stop shrapnel then you're going to end up in a situation where assuming you have four guns a hit to a two gun mount you've lost half your guns whereas a hit to a single gun mount you've only lost a quarter of your guns. The other main issue is the size of the ship. Now bearing in mind that the W and Z class, which obviously this question was in the video for, are smaller destroyers and a lot of interwar destroyers are kind of small destroyers in the 12 to 1500 ton range. And much like you sometimes see on the odd cruiser, a twin gun mount takes up more space, more, well, the mount obviously requires a circular pedestal, but particularly of concern is the beam. If the beam of the gun mount is too wide, that can have it can cause difficulties for the ship. Um, if it's just a mount sitting on top of the ship, um, it can cause balance issues. It can cause access issues, and if it's a slightly more advanced type where you're having the ammunition fed straight up to you from below and obviously you need two ammunition feeds and everything then you could have your ammunition feed systems worryingly close to the outside of the hull um, or again taking up too much space in the hull itself which makes getting past and running other systems past it etc quite difficult whereas obviously a single gun mount occupies less space and therefore will fit onto a narrower smaller hull and you can see this reflected to a degree in that when you think about the 
destroyers in World War II that had twin gun mounts, the Tribals, um, some of the latter German uh, ship destroyers, the Gearings, and the Summoners immediately before them, and many of the Japanese uh, destroyers that came after the Fubukis, then you realize that all of those, and French ones as well for that matter, in some cases, pretty much all of those are larger vessels. The Italians are kind of the exception to the rule in that they built some reasonably regular sized destroyers with a pair of twin gun mounts. But pretty much everybody else, when you see the twin gun mounts come about, you're looking at destroyers that are at least 17 to 1800 tons standard displacement or more because they have the whole width to be able to afford them. There are also a few other small issues, like the fact that if your destroyer guns are dual purpose, a single gun mount is often faster to traverse and elevate than a twin gun mount. Um, obviously, once you get things like uh, remote power control going, then that's not necessarily always the case. But for much of the period in the run up to World War II and early World War II, when destroyers are being designed, you know, it, it is the case that a single gun will move and track faster than a twin gun. So that does make it slightly better for anti aircraft purposes. And whilst it's not design consideration at the time of construction, it is possibly a useful thing to note when it comes to upgrading your ships. Kind of similar to the issue of damage, it's much easier to upgrade a ship with single gun turrets without losing too much of its firepower as compared to a ship that's got a twin gun turret or mounting. So if you compare, say... Um, upgrading a gearing or upgrading a fletcher so the gearing obviously starts off with six guns the fletcher with five guns if you discover that you need to i don't know install an extra radar unit or uh, you want to put some more 40 millimeter in or something and the only available space and weight is to by removing a five inch gun mount well on a fletcher you remove a single gun mount you still have four guns and you can put the mount in on a gearing, you have to remove a twin gun mount, because it only has twin gun mounts, which means you've... or you're also down to four guns. But the Fletcher, with its four guns, still has full 360 coverage. With the gearing, if you remove the aft mount, you now have no 5-inch gun cover aft. And if you remove the forward mount, or one of the forward mounts, then you basically are down to Fletcher-grade firepower, but with more of a chance of it being knocked out, because you're just having the two twin mounts which, you know, is a much more of a climb down for a gearing than it would be for a Fletcher. So th that's not, as I say, not a initial consideration, but something to bear in mind when you're upgrading. Michael J asks, will you be making videos about ship classes from more modern times, Falklands and Gulf War One era, for example? Well, this question comes up occasionally, and, you know, I have answered it a few times, but there are always new viewers. So for those of you who are unaware, uh, no, I won't. Um, the channel stops its coverage at ships that are effectively wholly designed by 1950. So something like the Forestal class carries as pretty much as far as you're going to get. Now, obviously, some ships that are design complete by that point and either then constructed or have just been constructed do continue their careers past 1950. And I'll cover what their careers were. But post 1950, I don't cover any of that to a involve political connotations because pretty much any warship that's built after that period in any major navy is going to have been involved in at least one major conflict which it still has a lot of political sensitivities around it which is just an unnecessary distraction for the channel and two you end up looking very quickly at ships that are equipped mainly with missile systems and one, missile technology is not something that I have anywhere near as much understanding of as I do compared with sort of ship gun based technology. And secondly, you also very, run very quickly into issues of uh, classification. So, you know, if you were to talk about a Sea Dart missile or an SM2 or whatever, you face a quandary. Do you tell everyone what the publicly rated missile ranges in which case anyone with any actual knowledge who you know serves in any kind of navy that uses that missile is probably going to take one look at you and go mm-hmm yeah sure sure mate whatever 
do you, if you happen to know, say what the actual missile range is and then get a knock on a door from some men in dark suits? Or do you fudge it and say something along the lines of, well, it's something beyond X, at which point you'll get a bunch of people screaming at you going, oh, no, but the official figures say this, you're wrong. And you'll probably get a knock on the door from people who want to know how you know it's beyond X. <laughs> so it's just not worth it unfortunately certainly not for the kind of format that the channel does where you know give you some idea of what the ships are actually capable of the only exception and i mean it is a it's a reasonable caveat i think is that if i am interviewing somebody who's actually served aboard a ship uh post 1950 or served in a navy post 1950 uh, whether that be falklands the 50s themselves or as you've seen earlier the interview with captain sequest of uss iowa then obviously the channel is covering something that is post 1950 but i cover that um because at that point i am interviewing someone who was there they did the thing they served on the ship they served in the navy i am allowing you to hear what they have to say it's not me making any representation one way or the other about that ship or that navy's capabilities um, effectively, if you want to disagree with what they say about what their ship could do or what their navy could do, well, take it up with them <laughs> at that point, and good luck to you. <laughs> General Vicus asks, I recently saw a table of naval expenditures which records that British naval estimates were only 40% greater than France's in 1870, and only 18% greater in 1880, but about 100% greater than Germany's in the period of 1900 to 1914. If these figures are accurate, was the Royal Navy's overall relative advantage really so much during the Anglo-German naval race than it had been in the 19th century, as these figures would suggest? And if so, why does the traditional narrative portray a century of British naval dominance between Trafalgar and Dreadnought broken only by the Anglo-German naval race? In part, it's down to efficiency, and in part, it's down to what we could loosely call legacy ships. So, British shipyards, uh, they adopted industrial revolution practice slightly earlier than most, and to be honest, they were just producing so many ships through the 19th century, they were very good at what they did. Uh, you can even see this in the early 20th century, where, you know, if if push comes to shove, they're able to kick Dreadnought out incredibly quickly, and the rest of their ships, the Dreadnought battleships and Super Dreadnoughts, to roughly average two years from keel to commission. Whereas, say, in the US, where limited budgets mean the shipyards don't have as much experience, therefore aren't as efficient, it's more like two and a half to three years. And this translates into the 19th century. British shipyards are simply more efficient on a, a pound, pound per ship ton produced basis than French shipyards generally are which means that even if the estimate naval estimates are as you say 40% greater or 18% greater the british can actually get a lot more ships for that money than the french can which hides some of the um advantage that the royal navy has when you just look at the pure financial figures the german shipyards although they were still somewhat slower than the royal navy shipyards were actually unsurprisingly enough given that it's germany um relatively efficient so the difference in pound or mark paid per ton um per month produced or whatever measure you want to use was a lot narrower when it was the anglo-german naval arms race the second part is as i mentioned kind of if you want to call it legacy shipping in 1900 through 1914 especially after the advent of dreadnought and the battle cruiser and what was would become the light cruiser at the time the light armored cruiser and the, the full-on destroyer it was pretty much a whole scale fleet replacement program from the ground up so both sides were almost starting from zero the old legacy protected cruisers torpedo boats obviously pre-dreadnoughts and, and armored cruisers very rapidly became obsolete so starting from the ground up the the difference that one ship could make to either side was a lot more substantial than it had been at the beginning of the 20 very beginning of the 20th century uh, but 
when you're looking at the 19th century, although technology is advancing in the latter part of the 19th century at a phenomenal rate when it comes to naval uh, technology, as you can see here from this picture, the simple fact is that broadly, even though as a frontline battle unit, ships could be obsolete inside of a decade, like say HMS Warrior, then they were still useful as second line ships or colonial ships. And so what you saw in 1870s and 1880s was that whilst Britain wasn't necessarily spending two, three hundred percent more than France, because she had spent phenomenal amounts of money in the 1860s, the, there was a legacy of ships that were still considered useful in some way, shape or form. France is, uh, and the other thing you've got to remember is in 1870, you've got the Franco-Prussian War going. Um, but basically it meant that as you go through the 1870s and 1880s, the British have this huge backlog of already built ships that give them a massive numerical superiority. And with France going into the Jeune Ecole period around about the 1870s and 1880s, you also have to take into account that whilst the British may only be building a limited number of modern capital ships like the Inflexible or whatever, the French aren't building any. So simply by having, you know, Devastation, Thunderer, Dreadnought, Inflexible, etc. in the 1870s, the British automatically have infinitely more modern frontline capital units than the French do because the French are just building cruisers and destroyers. And at the time, well, torch destroyers and torpedo boats at the time, but it means that the overall numerical supremacy of the Royal Navy is quite substantial in the nine, latter part of the 19th century, beyond what you'd think from just the general naval expenditures on a year-by-year -year basis. And it's it's a similar thing to what you actually see in the Napoleonic Wars as well, Uh the naval spending on both sides at different points in the Napoleonic Wars can sometimes look quite similar, but the Royal Navy, through a mixture of capturing and having a larger fleet in reserve in the first place to start with, has a numerical advantage throughout the war that even allying with the Spanish can't quite offset. F12MNB asks... Well, many World War II ships had additional anti-aircraft weapons added. Where was their ammunition stored? These weapons, both as pom-poms, etc., seem to use ammunition at a prodigious rate. Were there refitted magazines, or where they stored, or did they store the ammunition wherever there was room? We hear of torpedoes detonating when it did, um, but did anti-aircraft ammunition cook off when ships were hit? It varied from ship to ship, and how planned it was. Um, and also just how much space was available. And you've got to remember this covers everything from the heavy AA all the way through you know, 40 and 20 mil um, down to whatever the smallest weapon you might happen to have on the ship was. Now, when it came to the heavier stuff, whether that be 4, 4.5 or 5 inch or 5.25 inch, um, although there weren't any refits with 5.25s, um, they tended to take over pre-existing magazines. So, for example, on HMS Hood, uh, although she didn't receive a full uh, workover, when she was originally constructed, she had 5.5-inch secondaries and a handful of high angle, 4-inch high-angle guns. But in her final iteration, by the time she went out to Denmark straight, the 5.5-inch magazines had been taken over by more 4-inch anti-aircraft um, ammunition and so uh, you you I mean the, the the dividers were still there as far as I can tell from the plans but you can argue having a continuous four inch anti-aircraft ammunition uh, magazine that ran from the back of the engineering compartment to the front of uh, the first aft 15 inch magazine possibly um, may have contributed very slightly uh, to her loss but it, it, that's a somewhat weak argument considering there was 5.5 inch ammo there anyway although you know what the characteristics of 5.5 inch ammo would have been instead of 4 inch anti-aircraft ammo if when the Bismarck shell exploded there 
that's a, a separate matter for debate. But it, you can see, especially when you look at something like the Queen Elizabeth refits or HMS Renown's refit, where there was previously a gap between the machinery space and the first bit of magazine that you came across. And then so after the refit, it just went engine room, um, heavy anti-aircraft magazine, 15-inch magazine. So that's the heavy stuff. With the lighter stuff, the 40 mil and the 20 mil, there would be ready-use lockers near the guns, generally speaking. The guns themselves, especially the 40 mils, would also have a bunch of ammunition stored on the mountings, in and around the mountings as well. So there'd be a lot of ammunition on deck, mainly because whilst, yes, it was possible that a hit might cook it off, uh, cooking off 40 millimeter ammunition or 20 mil ammo is mainly dangerous to the crewmen who are in the area, who hopefully will have gone out of the area rather than post haste if they realize there's an ammunition fire going on. It just doesn't achieve the concentration or the explosive power to be a serious threat to the existence of the ship in the way that perhaps a four or five inch fire might potentially if there was enough ammo out out there up top. And when you look at the plans, especially if you look and compare plans of, say, something like a Colorado class in 1940-41 compared with the Colorado class in 1944-45, you'll see a gradual proliferation of 20 millimeter and 40 millimeter storage spaces and magazines. Some of those, depending on the ship, whether obviously British ship, American ship, whatever, some of those might be taking over magazine space for guns that have been removed um so you know if you're taking away a bunch of casement weapons and replacing them with fewer uh five inch uh 38s or even the the shorter barrel aa only guns you might not necessarily be using all the magazine space that was left over from the old long barrel five inch guns but also there would be 20 mil and 40 mil uh, magazines or storage areas that were slightly higher in the ship than the main magazines and the and the heavy AA magazines. Again, simply because even stored in fairly large numbers, the individual explosive power and even the collective explosive power of 20mm and 40mm ammunition is much less of a hazard, although it would be obviously more of a hazard than not having it there. Um, the general idea, of course, being the most vulnerable ammunition is the stuff you shoot off at the incoming enemy as soon as humanly possible. So it varies quite a bit. And obviously that's mostly talking about battleships. When it comes to cruisers or destroyers, things could get on paper a little bit more dicey because you didn't necessarily have the volume to play with and you didn't necessarily you weren't necessarily replacing other guns, so you didn't have their magazine spaces to use. But then on the flip side, to be honest, you know, a destroyer doesn't really have that much armor period so where exactly you store the 20 mil and the 40 mil ammo probably doesn't make too much of a difference as long as it's in a shrapnel proof area because if you're going to get hit by an eight inch shell or you know a battleship shell or even a six inch shell chances are the that shell is going to go wherever it wants to anyway including your potentially your main gun magazine <laughs> Mr. Nico Jack asks what's the difference between a small fleet carrier and a light carrier so there aren't too many examples of either, most of which obviously are focused on World War II. Uh, there's more examples of light carriers than small fleet carriers. But broadly speaking, uh, you can't distinguish them by being purpose-built versus conversions because you have something like, say, the uh, Japanese Hio, which is a, a light fleet carrier or a small fleet carrier, compared to the Shikakus and Hiryus of the, her day, but is a conversion. Whereas you have something like Saipan, which is a light carrier, admittedly adapted from a cruiser hull, but purpose-built as a carrier from the keel up. So that's out. As a rule of thumb, normally a small fleet carrier will carry more aircraft than a light carrier. So uh, when you look at a light carrier like, say, the Independence class, which is kind of the prototypical one, that's got an air group in the 30s, usually. Um, drops down a little bit, depending if they're using heavier strike aircraft and, uh, and such like, but usually somewhere in the 30s or plus or minus a few. Um, of, obviously, Saipan being uh, the largest variant of the light carrier has 
a slightly larger air group entering the low 40s, but most light fleet carriers as designed, things like Hio, Junyo, the Colossus and Majestic classes, normally will have air groups in the mid 40s going up into the 50s. So a light fleet carrier generally has a slightly larger air group, whereas a full fleet carrier might have, you know, starting in the high 50s and going up all the way to 100 in World War II, and the light carrier, say, can be high 30s, low 30s, even high 20s, depending on the air group mix. The other main difference is going to be that a light carrier, for the most part, again, these are all kind of rules of thumb, but a light carrier for the most part is a hull that has been turned into a carrier with the main objective being here's a hangar box, here's a flight deck, here's some aircraft and the relevant ammunition, etc. And that is really the extent of the design necessity. Light carriers tend to be fairly vulnerable to taking hits because the more extensive armor protection and torpedo protection, etc., that you might find on a fleet carrier tends to be lacking, either to save weight or to save space, or both. Whereas on a light fleet carrier, most of the time, or small fleet carrier, most of the time, those systems will be present at least in some way, shape, or form. Of course, you do occasionally get the, the odd rule to fire with things like say USS Wasp which is very definitely a small fleet carrier but has most of the vulnerabilities that you would associate with a light carrier hence why this is rule of thumb and not definitive but it serves as a generally useful guide. Rob McElwee asks was the 8 inch gun cruiser superior to the 6 inch gun later cruisers? It depends which ones you're looking at. Um, Obviously, you get something like a Worcester, which is its complete outside context problem in the realms of comparing 6-inch and 8-inch gun cruisers. It's a lot bigger than a Treaty cruiser. It's got the rapid-firing guns, etc. So putting that to one side and just looking at the more regular types, I'd say, again, it does very much depend on the exact type because if you're looking at, say, let's say a... An original model county class without the armor upgrades or a French Duquesne class or a Pensacola class. Um, basically, a lot of the 1920s heavy cruisers where they don't have all that much in the way of belt armor protection, if any. Then if they're going up against, say, a Cleveland or a Crown Colony or something along those lines, you know, a, a late era six inch cruiser then the six, that 6-inch six cruiser has a reasonable chance of a victory because usually the speed differential isn't enough for the 8-inch cruiser to guarantee maintaining the range. Yes, they've got superior range with and superior hitting power per gun, but the 6-inch cruiser is probably going to get close enough to start doing damage, and when it does, it's going to have more guns and more rapid-firing guns. And without the ability to resist in a similar size, resist the shells, and with a similar sized hull, the eight-inch cruiser will be at a disadvantage. The flip side to that is when you look at some of the more heavily protected, arguably better designed, better built eight-inch cruisers. So that'd be things like the upgraded counties, uh, Wichita, Algerie, or the Italian Zaras, as depicted here. Well, those ships actually have the armor to resist six-inch gunfire at reasonable ex uh, range a reasonable range of ranges i guess um at, and obviously you know the range issue uh, have superior range with their eight inch guns and hitting power which is what the other ships had as well but because they can hold out against incoming six inch gunfire for a lot longer then i would say arguably that they still do have a certain advantage of the six inch gun later cruisers because they can hurt the six inch cruisers for a considerable time period while the six inch cruisers try and close the range to get to a point where they can do the same. Now obviously you do have, as with battleships, the fact that you could smash up fire control equipment and other more vulnerable areas that might make a significant difference to the overall battle, but that is relying on somewhat random chance, whereas, you know, a, a brace of eight inch shells to the engine room will cripple your average six inch cruiser. 
um, at least enough for the eight inch cruiser to then completely choose and dominate the range um, especially at range where it can hit and the uh, other side can't um, but you know it's always going to vary a little bit on the situation as a rough guide you can look at say something like the conflicts in the mediterranean where italian eight inch gun cruisers quite often came up against british six inch gun cruisers um, even if a lot of the British cruisers were Leanders, Arethusers, and the occasional Dido thrown in there for good measure, but there were a few towns as well. And usually the British approach, unless they had a significant superiority in numbers when faced by long-range Italian 8-inch gunfire, was to either drop smoke and try and sucker them into closer range, drop smoke and wait for reinforcements, or drop smoke and run away because they knew they weren't going to get the better of the Italian cruisers in a long-range gunfight, and the Italian cruisers had no particular reason to close the range. Shane Patrick asks, I was wondering if submarines carried a little boat in World War II for visiting other ships or landing special forces. Generally, no. Space aboard a submarine, this is a World War I sub, but it kind of illustrates the point, a lot of World War II subs weren't too much larger. Space aboard a submarine was at an extreme premium. Um, you know, weapons, supplies, the crew, etc., etc. And so, well, you couldn't have a rigid boat at all. Um, anything that you were going to carry would have to come up through the conning tower or be strapped to the outside, maybe under a fairing. So if you're going to have anything, it would be a, an inflatable or collapsible boat, maybe with an outboard motor. But again, you know, the space requirements for storing the motor, its fuel, maintenance equipment, tools the boat itself in whatever form it's collapsed into etc possibly a pump to reinflate it if it's an inflatable one it's just too much space to be occupied by something that is rarely if ever going to be used um, if you were a sub and you wanted to visit another ship generally you'd just go alongside that other ship or the dockside or that ship would send boats out to you um, now occasionally especially on the larger subs you could and in some times did carry such small collapsible boats but that would only be for specific missions so if you knew that you were taking a bunch of special forces as you mentioned to go and land on an enemy coastline or something like that then you might very well actually deploy um, with a couple of small boats aboard but that would be because you knew absolutely that you were going to use them in that particular mission and once that mission was done unless you're going on another similar mission shortly thereafter those would be removed. Vokir asks to what extent did Hirohito, Wilhelm II and Franz Joseph influence or guide their national military dash naval procurement policy in the lead up to their respective wars? And to what extent do you think these leaders can or should be held to account for the actions of their nations? I think you're looking at three very different people there. Hirohito, whilst he broadly did support Japanese expansion efforts, was not really down in the details of, you know, uh, yes, I want this built, no, I don't want that built. Well, the Japanese military have had very much a stranglehold on the Japanese government in the run-up to World War II and during World War II itself. So it was more a case of practically, in the case of the Navy, let's say, the Navy coming up and saying, we would like to build this, O oh great and glorious emperor. Don't you think it's a good idea? And then the emperor would look at it, and then, unless it was absolutely mind-bogglingly expensive, he did raise a few questions over the Yamatos, for example, It'll be a case of, yes, I approve, at which point everyone will be like, yes, the great and glorious emperor has approved our plan. Clearly it is blessed by divine wisdom. Let us go off and build this thing we wanted to build in the first place anyway. <laughs> um, I mean, Hirohito wasn't a figurehead the way that he was made in the post-war environment. But, yeah, as I say, he's not a figurehead. He's not ceremonial, but he didn't have anywhere near as much power as you might otherwise think given the amount of deference that was shown to him it was more along the lines of we will show you great deference and respect because you are a divine emperor right up until you start doing something we manifestly don't like like you know say trying to order a surrender because two cities got just just got nuked at which point elements of the japanese military tried to kill him <laughs> 
Um, Franz Joseph is kind of the midpoint because you know, he ha- he did have a bit more of an active role in determining what was going to be built, what wasn't going to be built, and where it was going to be built. Um, but he was still very much reliant on people presenting him plans. He would give kind of a grand overarching, well, I, I want us to be at this level of glory on the table of great powers, and now you tell me how we're going to achieve this. Wilhelm II is at the other extreme end. He very much influenced and, and guided procurement policy. Um, obviously, with along with von Terpitz, he was instrumental in getting the Navy laws passed, which set the ever-increasing upper limits for what the German Navy was supposed to have. And he also had a fair degree of an active hand in making design decisions and design suggestions for the German Navy itself. So he's probably the single most involved leader of those three. And to skirt around the political question, I think it's probably roughly on the same kind of scale. Um, You know, ultimately, as the leader of a nation, the responsibility stops with you. But when you look at the history of World War I and World War II, Wilhelm II is much, much more of a decisive driving figure in getting Germany into a position where she's arranged against the alliance she's arranged against and into the war she actually physically ends up engaged in, as opposed to either of the other two. Matt Kidd asks, Why were the vibration problems of the North Carolinas missed during the design process? Did the tools to predict and mitigate these problems not exist at the time? So part of the reason they were missed is that some things don't scale. So when you're running model tests, for example, model tests of holes in the water using Froude equations, etc., is a very useful way of determining things like your ship's speed and potentially its agility and so forth. But whilst that scales pretty well with, you know, a small model as opposed to the full-size ship model, and you can work out from your measurements of the model what's likely to happen with the ship, other elements really don't scale all that well. So with the square cube law, for example, you can't make a one-tenth or one-hundredth or whatever scale uh, model of your ship out of steel and expect it to float, because proportionally any kind of steel that's going to be thicker than foil, i.e. enough to keep the ship with some degree of structural integrity, is going to end up proportionally having you know hull plates that are feet thick if you scale them up which means that it would just sink because it would displace proportionally far more than the actual full-size ship which is why ship models of the time running tanks were generally made of wood or other similar things also you know making them of wood meant that if you made a slight adjustment to the hull shape it was very easy bit of sandpaper bit of varnish and you're good to go And one of the things that doesn't quite scale, especially when you're using a solid wood model as opposed to a, relatively speaking, hollow steel full-size ship, is um, vibration and frequencies. Um, Because the vibration issues caused by resonance that were experienced by the North Carolina class are not going to have... Either they wouldn't show up, or if they did show up, they wouldn't show up to a degree that measurements of the time are going to actually notice on a small wooden scale model so the typical way of checking your whole form on how it's going to behave wouldn't have picked it up now the science of calculating resonant frequencies based on complex systems of fluid movement did exist the tacoma narrows bridge disaster had kind of given that whole idea a bit of a kick up the backside the problem is that the calculations necessary to do it for a ship moving through water with a relatively complex underwater hull form, you know, like the skegged form of a North Carolina-class battleship with the propellers and rudders, etc. Well, you can do those calculations by hand, but it's incredibly difficult to do. It will take a very, very long time. And you have to calculate that for every possible speed regimen and potentially also for certain water densities, depending on the salinity and temperature levels that you might be in. And quite frankly, so whilst technically speaking, 
the tools to calculate and notice this did exist. Practically speaking, they didn't because no one was actually doing that. Um, no one was running th that many calculations. You'd basically be enslaving half of America's mathematics degree holding university graduates for a year just to r work out this one particular aspect of ship design. <laughs> um, there are some sort of rough shorthand equations that you can use, but they're nowhere near as accurate or effective. These days, the equations haven't changed, but what has it changed is our computing and calculation power. So instead of having to use hundreds upon hundreds of poor innocent maths graduates, you can just stick a fairly accurate 3D model into a fluid mechanic simulator on a computer and hit run and walk away for a few days and come back to more information than you could ever want to know about the performance and resonance of your hull at various speeds. So yeah that that's basically why they missed it there's there were a few precedents and there were a few potential ways they might have guessed that something like that might happen um but following the normal ship design process at the time given the resources they had there was a little bit of a blind spot when it came to things like this Salamander Pete asks, regarding the World War II King George V class battleships the two named after admirals in particular I think many of your viewers will be aware of George Anson and some of his achievements, but what of Admiral Howe? I expect he must have done some great things to have a battleship named after him, but what did he do to be recognised in this way? So Howe had a pretty consistent level of excellence. He was seen as a rising star in the Royal Navy for quite some time. He was present at the Battle of Quiberon Bay uh, as captain of HMS Magnanime. Yes, another captured French ship. Um, he did fairly well. Um, and the American War of Independence, uh, obviously fighting for the British. And he had a number of other reasonable actions, including a, a quite important one, although often underappreciated, um, the 1782 relief of Gibraltar. Um, it didn't end in a glorious battle or anything, but it was incredibly important both for the immediate future of Britain's empire at the time and for obviously holding Gibraltar its continued existence later on but he's probably most notable for one being actually fairly beloved by the sailors um, which not all admirals necessarily were uh, but also for winning the Battle of the Glorious First of June, so named because it was so far away from any nearby landmass no one could find somewhere to name it after. Uh, which is a bit of a weird one in that it was a fairly decisive victory against the French fleet at the start of the period of, of the, where the fleet was part of the French revolutionary government as opposed to the uh, French royal government. And as I say, it, decisive victory in military terms, possibly strategically not so much because the point was to actually try and intercept and destroy or capture a large convoy that the French fleet was guarding, the French fleet effectively sacrificing itself to allow the convoy to pass through. So the strategic objective was failed, but the victory over the French and the amount of destruction wreaked upon the French fleet was quite considerable, especially for the time period that this happened. Because remember, the kind of crushing victories that Nelson would introduce were still a couple of years off at this point. Although not too far off at this point, it was only four years before the Battle of the Nile, but it did give a taste of what was to come when it came to the Royal Navy dealing with the French Navy, as opposed to previously, where outside of you know the odd instant like Kiberon Bay, most other battles had either been much more closely fought in terms of overall casualties, or if it had been a British victory, the French had lost considerably fewer ships. Leon Wu asks... So we now think of HMS Warspite as a ship that had actual plot armour, but how was she viewed at various times during her service in World War I and World War II? Was she seen as as epic as we see her now, 70-odd years later? Her fortunes waxed and waned a little bit, but mostly were on the uptick after a certain point. So, and when she initially launched, was brought into service, she was just another Queen Elizabeth-class battleship, part of a run at that well, as far as anybody could tell, the way things were going was probably going to end up being superseded in half a decade or so by some bigger, considerably newer design. Bearing in mind that, you know, War Spite hit the water just over half a decade after Dreadnought. Uh, 
so <laughs> there's a considerable change in capabilities there. Then she fights at Jutland, and this is kind of the turning point, because in the immediate aftermath of Jutland, she's actually, not necessarily by the crew, but by elements of the general public, um, actually quite derided because she's released back to uh, back to go back to dock early because of the damage she takes facing off against the high seas fleet she enters in a fairly beaten up state under the bridge um, to her anchorage and people are throwing coal and booing and hissing at her because it's she's thought to have run away from a battle that didn't seem to have gone all that well anyway but as time goes on her crew and her reputation in the navy gets two boosts one from the fact that she demonstrates just how much of a pounding she can take without sinking um so people are quite encouraged by that you know being on war spikes seems to be a fairly safe bet of survival and secondly because of her rudder jamming and circling around the armored cruiser hms warrior thus admittedly inadvertently saving her although at the time the, the general the sort of rumor dash story that went around was actually that this was deliberately bullet sponging to preserve the crew of warrior and of course the warriors crew are very very happy to have survived so they're not they don't particularly care one way or the other whether warspite meant to circle them or not the simple fact was that warspite drew so much fire that most of warriors crew survived and of course at that point when you're thinking very positively you're more likely to think positively generally of you know the ship that that um that saved you so therefore clearly it was deliberate um and so she had this reputation as both incredibly hard as nails and self-sacrificing so that put her sort of in the good books of most of the royal navy thereafter she was seen she was seen as a both a lucky and fortunate vessel then of course you have peacetime not a tremendous amount happens in peacetime then she gets her refit and she becomes one of well actually at the time she exits her refit she is the most modern ship in the fleet um obviously shortly thereafter you've got the king george v coming in and uh valiant queen elizabeth and renown coming out of their refits as well but she is kind of the leading edge of the royal navy for a short while in the late 1930s and therefore you know attracts a little bit more attention and then of course she goes off into world war ii and starts racking up the not notoriety pretty darn quickly i mean battleship sailing up a fjord coming out intact having slaughtered half the kriegsmarines destroyers in po the popular parlance then she goes off into the mediterranean squares off with the italian fleet despite the fact that she's much much um older than the majority of the opposition she's facing particularly the dorias and um the Cavours are about her age as anyway but then she you know she faces off with Cesare wins um fights at Matapan wins and uh, you know she she very quickly racking up this tally of victory so everyone's like yeah you know her her reputation from World War One hasn't hasn't abandoned her she's a good ship um and then of course as more modern ships begin to supplant her she ends up on other duties but then she starts taking hit after hit after hit. She takes hits off Crete, admittedly smaller ones. She takes massive hits off Salerno uh, with the Fritz X. And she just keeps on trucking. Um, you know, she just will not die. And so her reputation only increases as World War II goes on. And it was a very, very unfortunate and very unpopular move to scrap her afterwards. Capitano Lorenzo asks, when the Germans surrendered their capital ships to Scapa Flow after World War I, did the Royal Navy engineers have opportunities to do technical examinations of any of their vessels prior to scuttling? And if they did, were there any technical discoveries of significance that the Royal Navy found to be useful? I do not remember where I read it, but I thought I read that some of the German vessels were able to flood their magazines faster than the Royal Navy could. Not before the scuttling, no, because at the time that the German fleet was in Scapaflow, remember the peace negotiations were still being worked out. There was an armistice, but whilst the armistice required that the German fleet or a good portion of it be in Scapaflow, it wasn't a case of these ships were already in Allied possession. Indeed, the whole scuttling was over the German impression that they were going to end up in Allied possession. So the german fleet whilst it remained in scapa flow and on the surface 
was still manned by German crews, even if they weren't allowed to hoist the German flag, and the Royal Navy just kept an eye on them. Now, what happened when the scuttling occurred was a few ships were relatively quickly salvaged. A lot of them weren't. A lot of them took a lot longer to salvage. Some of them are still there. Uh, but one or two were not actually sunk, or rather they were salvaged, dash driven ashore um, before the scuttling could take full effect. And one of those was one of the German Baden-class battleships. And so between that ship and a couple of others that had a similar fate and one or two that were hoisted up fairly in fairly short order, that was when the Royal Navy started examining them. Um, so in the immediate aftermath of the scuttling and then post-war, there are a whole load of firing, uh, firing trials done against the battle, the big battleship, the 15-inch ship, in the aftermath of the war after all the technical examination so that's where they found out about so what were the levels of german flash tightness what were their magazine flooding rates which you mentioned um, what was their armor quality like all sorts of things that was a very detailed technical examination that was done and then after they'd done all the technical examination they shot it a bit to see what the their new green boy shells would do to german battleship armor and then it was broken up into bits obviously for salvage reclamation at and study in more close detail of some of the more intricate systems like fire control equipment and so forth. Um, so, yeah, quite an extensive technical examination of vessels, some of which weren't properly scuttled or fully scuttled, um, but not before the scuttling. Brad asks, how did the Canopus's engineer get away with letting the engines fail for so long under the circumstances? Were there no other people on board with enough knowledge to see what was going on? There's a few reasons. I mean, obviously, the chief one is the fact the chief engineer had gone slightly crazy, um, which didn't help. And there is a hierarchy of things, because the thing was, you know, suffering from a mental breakdown doesn't necessarily mean you're going to go wandering around the ship preaching doom um, and, you know, all hail, all hail this random parrot that I picked up in a port visit the way that a few people did in the Second Pacific Squadron. Um, it can just express itself and in this case seems to have expressed itself in massively over overly pessimistic outlooks on everything in life it's almost a i guess a, a cross between crippling depression and the actual mental breakdown that was going on in the chief engineer's head and you know the prop there were some engineering problems with canopus and people report them to the chief engineer. He's supposed to be the professional. And then he makes the assessment. Says, okay, I think it's going to take this long. Or looks around, okay, there's these other problems as well. But you're also waiting on him to order the repairs. Because you might have spotted that problem. But you don't know as just a regular engineering officer or rating. Well, maybe the chief engineer has spotted some other problem. And if I fix this, is that going to cause this thing to explode? Because maybe this other thing is that I don't know about is a problem. So you have to wait on what he says. He's obviously reporting to the captain that everything is doom and gloom and you can only crawl around at a speed that would disgrace an early ironclad. And you get the situation that you end up in. And this is all compounded by the kind of ship that Canopus was. She'd just come off of two and a bit years in reserve so it wasn't like she was sailing with an experienced crew where they knew the ship really well and they knew each other really well and perhaps you could therefore spot if the chief engineer had gone slightly off into la la land it was a thrown together scratch crew a mixture of a small caretaker crew royal navy regulars royal navy volunteer reserve royal navy reserve few other people here and there very um random assortment of people and they'd only been at sea for a few months so they don't even necessarily know their ship as a whole particularly brilliantly let alone the ins and outs of all the uh, the finer technologies so if someone who's ostensibly fairly high up the rank and should know what he's saying says actually no this is bad then you kind of just have to take it as read that it is bad um, until such time as things are proven otherwise which obviously eventually they were so, yeah, that that's the unfortunate circumstance. of It's one of the things that can go wrong if you take a ship out of reserve, fill it with whoever you've got, and put it straight onto the front line. And bear in mind, the situation doesn't last too long, because um, from the from October 
to November, which is basically from the start of Craddock's search for um, Von Spee's squadron to when Canopus arrives back at the Falkland Islands, having already cleared up the issue with her engineer and then obviously being used as a, a grounded shore battery, is only a month. You know, she got, starts off her search on the 8th of October and she is back in Stanley by the 8th of November. So this the whole problem with her engineer is only a matter of a couple of weeks, if that, before it's sorted out, which you know is actually probably not a tremendously poor turnaround time for someone spotting that there's a mental health problem with a chief engineer in those circumstances and in an era where mental health problems aren't really acknowledged as a thing. And that brings us to the end of this week's Dry Dock. It's just a fraction shorter than average, so apologies for that. But as I am trying to create two months' worth of content for the trip to the States as well at the same time, hopefully you can understand. Um, so not a tremendous amount of channel admin this week. Other than to say, good news, everyone. Coming in clutch at the very last minute, a visa appointment came up. Uh, someone presumably cancelled it in Belfast, at which point it was a case of pack Mrs. Drack on a plane to Belfast ASAP, get her application in, and it was approved. So, uh, in a big turnaround for the books, Mrs. Drack actually now has her visa to come to the States. So, uh, the great There and Drack Again tour will feature both Mrs. Drack and, of course, me, Drack, plus my two support crew. So, hooray, the quartet is back in action. <laughs> 